Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers right now on Morning News Now. Nearing normal, the CDC now says fully vaccinated Americans can skip the mask when heading outside. President Biden, though, still urging vigilance. I urge all Americans, don't let up now. Keep following the guidance. Go get your vaccination now. What these new guidelines mean for those with and without their shots. Before the nation, tonight on the eve of his 100th day in the White House, President Biden will deliver his first ever joint address to Congress. What we're expecting from Capitol Hill as Biden works to sell his agenda to the American people. Back to work, many Americans are ready to ditch working from home and return to their normal offices, but they want to do it safely. Is rapid testing at work the answer? And bugging out, Florida is looking to crack down on its population of a particularly nasty species of mosquito, one that can spread ailments like the Zika virus and yellow fever. Now officials think they've got an answer. We'll let you in on the buzz behind a new experiment, genetically modified mosquitoes. And Joe, all I know is the normal ones love me. So hopefully <laughs> these JAMA ones don't. I'm from Minnesota where the unofficial state bird is the mosquito. So. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's disgusting. Yeah. We will get to that sort of disgusting story a little bit later, but this morning, part of everyday life is changing for the more than 96 million Americans who are fully vaccinated against COVID-19. The CDC now says those folks can ditch their face masks for most outdoor activities. President Biden is embracing the new guidelines, calling it progress in his goal to get the country closer to normal by the 4th of July. While we still have a long way to go in this fight and a lot of work to do in May and June to get us to July 4th, we've made stunning progress because of all of you, the American people. So for those who haven't gotten their vaccination yet, especially if you're younger or think you don't need it, this is another great reason to go get vaccinated now. Let's bring in NBC News health and medical reporter Erica Edwards to break down the new guidelines. So, Erica, these new recommendations change what both vaccinated and unvaccinated people can do outdoors. What does the CDC now consider safe? Hey, Joe, good morning. So first, let's be clear. These are not rules or mandates. It's simply a tool to help guide personal decision making as we try to get back to whatever normal is going to be. And it won't account for every situation you might find yourself in. But the CDC says that by far outside is safest, whether you're vaccinated or not. Now, the CDC has an illustration showing the safest activities for everyone. No masks necessary for anyone when you're outside doing things like going on a walk, running, biking, gathering with small groups of people who are vaccinated. Now, if you have not had the vaccine, the CDC still recommends masking around other unvaccinated people. Joe? So in some situations, it is still recommended that people do wear masks outdoors, even if they are vaccinated. What more can you tell us about that? Yeah, so let's take a look at what the CDC says about those uh, types of outdoor activities, especially dining outside. Now, fully vaccinated people can eat outdoors. They can ditch the masks. If you're not vaccinated, the CDC still recommends keeping those face coverings on, say, when you are, you know, maybe waiting for your food or the check. Now, for the first time, the CDC also addressed attending crowded outdoor events like concerts or sports. In that case, Everyone should remain masked in those situations, Joe. And Erica, what is the CDC saying about wearing masks indoors? Are there any changes at all there? No, the CDC still says that everyone should be masking inside public spaces like malls, churches, gyms, movie theaters, hair salons. Now, that said, they're saying that those areas are safer for people who have been vaccinated, again, as long as they continue to wear their masks. Doctors Fauci and Walensky, the CDC director, addressed indoor personal behavior yesterday during a during a briefing. We know that the virus spreads very well indoors until more people are vaccinated. And while we still have more than 50,000 cases a day, mask use indoors will provide extra protection. Even when you're talking about variants, indoors, outdoors, 
get vaccinated and you will certainly have a degree of protection. Okay, so here's the bottom line. We are getting a little bit closer to normal, but don't (laughs) throw away those masks just yet. Yeah, so Erica, Savannah, let me jump in here and ask you a couple things about that, because I think we've heard about how outdoor is safer, you know, since the beginning. I mean, we've seen families celebrate holidays outdoors, socially distanced. That's how people were seeing their elderly family members. But now there's a big difference here. We have this tool. We have the vaccine. So it, of course, makes sense. We know that outdoor is safer than indoor. We know that masks are safer than no masks. But as people get this vaccine and they're doing and taking that step that we've all been waiting for, do we have any idea when we might see indoor life really change for people who got the shot and be able to go back to more normal? Hey, Savannah. Well, I think it's really all going to come down to how we continue to progress in the pandemic. As cases continue to fall, and there is evidence they are falling for the most part across the nation, um, that will help us get a little bit back to normal. Also, the more people get vaccinated will also help. I do expect the CDC will continue to update this guidance as we move along over the next few months. And Erica, also the CDC released new guidance on summer camp saying everyone should wear masks even when they're outside. Uh, Can you sort of make sense of some different guidelines like that that we hear when we're hearing, you know, outside is safe, but then there are some stipulations there? I think it has to do with children who are not vaccinated. We don't have any vaccines for anyone under age 16. So in those situations, they still require masks. I know I was watching my daughter run track last night. We're all fully in masks. Um, You know, again, as we move forward and additional science comes out, uh, they might change that guidance. Um, But, but, you know, you're right. They didn't really address the, the, the situations where, you know, they know outdoor is safest, but uh, for kids, they still recommend wearing masks. Now, we do expect that Pfizer in the coming weeks will ask the FDA to approve its vaccine for kids between the ages of 12 and 15. So we're getting there a little slowly. And Erica, also on children, let's stay there for a minute and talk schools. Of course, one of the big things that every parent's wondering about. We saw this decision be made yesterday, this new guidance come out based on the science. That's what they said. You know, we're following this based on the data we have now. This is safe now. We had actually heard Dr. Anthony Fauci quite a while ago say that it is safe. There is a safe way to reopen schools, but a lot of schools still are not reopened. What do you think will be the latest there as we head into the fall? A lot, again, will depend on the vaccines. If, if kids can get the shots, that will certainly make schooling different in the fall. Um, it's unclear whether they will be required uh, to get the vaccine. But, you know, as we move forward and more kids are protected, that will certainly change the guidance. Now, we also know that kids, for the most part, do not get as sick as older adults. We also know that they can certainly transmit um, the virus. In Michigan now, for example, they are tracking more than 40 outbreaks in Michigan schools. Now, they're not huge outbreaks, but it's certainly an indication that the kids really can spread that virus. And then, of course, it can get out into the community for any uh, vulnerable adults. Erica, some good news this morning on the road to normalcy, but also a lot to make sense of. Thank you for walking us through it all. President Biden is expected to announce details of his American Families plan tonight when he heads to the Capitol to deliver his first joint address to Congress. The White House says the president's $1.8 trillion plan will include universal preschool and the creation of a national paid family leave program. Security will be elevated at the Capitol in the wake of the January 6th attack. And because of social distancing requirements, only 200 attendees are expected in the House chamber for the speech. Now, in a typical year, that number is around 1,600. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Vice President Kamala Harris will also make history, marking the first time that two women will be sitting on the dais behind the president. NBCNews.com senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece joins us now. So, Shannon, tell us what else are you learning about tonight's speech? Well, yes, you mentioned that ambitious child care plan with free child care, extending the child tax credit, and also will include free community college. Uh, that's going to come with a $1.5 trillion price tag. And we are expecting the president to outline how he's going to pay for that as well, which would include increasing taxes on the wealthiest Americans. In addition to that, we're also going to hear the president making this pitch for his $2 trillion infrastructure proposal that's currently before Congress, as well 
as a number of other issues, including police reform and racial justice. We expect that to be a big focus there. Uh, administration officials familiar with the speech tell us to expect him to reference George, George Floyd uh, and to push for passage of that George Floyd police reform bill. And it's also going to provide the president an opportunity before a primetime audience of millions of Americans to put pressure on Republicans to come to the table and work with him on many of these issues that pull quite well among Democrats and Republicans. You mentioned how the president hopes to pay for it, talking about taxes. Do we have any more details about what he plans to propose in order to cover all these costs? All right, well, one of the things administration officials told us uh, for this family's plan would be to increase the highest tax bracket back to where it was in pre-2017 levels. On his infrastructure plan, that is primarily going to come from increasing taxes on corporations and raising the corporate tax rate. Now, the White House says all of these things are open to negotiations. They are looking to work with Democrats or with Republicans on this. Republicans have already made a counterproposal, so expect there to be a lot of back and forth in the coming months. Speaking of back and forth, after the president's speech, who is delivering the GOP response? That's going to come from Senator Tim Scott. And I mentioned police reform a moment ago. He has been on the Republican side leading the push for a police reform bill. And he is an interesting choice for Republicans as well, because uh, he has managed to straddle this divide in the party between the Trump wing and the uh, you know more traditional conservative wing. He has good credentials with Trump and his allies, but he's also showed he will reach across the aisle and work with Democrats. So an interesting choice from Republicans, of course, very timely, given the focus on racial and justice issues. And that's not the only response. Unlike in previous years, progressives will be delivering their own formal response to President Biden's address, even though they're in the same party. Why is that? Right. Well, certainly an unusual move. Um, now, this is being organized by a far left wing group called uh, the Working Families Party. But Democratic Representative Jamal Bowman will be giving a response from the progressive point of view. And his spokesman has said to expect him to call for more action, bigger, bolder action than what we're going to hear the president outline later tonight. Has the White House said anything about this? The fact that someone within the party is also giving a response? No, they haven't. But, you know, the White House has been pretty good about navigating, being able to work with the sort of moderate wing of the Democratic Party and the progressives. And so far, the progressives in the Democratic Party, at least in Congress, have been pretty solidly behind the president, even if they would like to see him doing a bit more in certain areas. All right, Shannon Pettypiece, thank you so much. President Biden's address comes on his 99th day in office, and the stakes are high, as we were just discussing, as he hopes to pitch more of his agenda to the American people. MSNBC anchor Joshua Jackson joins us now. Joshua, good morning. Now, much of the president's focus has, of course, been on the pandemic, both getting people vaccinated and tackling the economic fallout. Now, we know he's reached a lot of the goals his administration has set for themselves. So what does he have to do tonight to continue to make progress here? He's going to have to prove that he can actually govern across the aisle and also govern without the benefit of measures like budget reconciliation. Remember, the COVID relief package was passed kind of at gunpoint with this legislative maneuver that allows the Democrats to work around the possibility of a filibuster. But he can't govern that way long term. And there is a legitimate argument as to whether or not the president is able to fund the other items on his agenda including with some of the tax increases that he is expected to propose tonight. So in a way, this might be sort of the beginning of the Biden presidency as usual and kind of the first time we will have seen Congress do regular Congress stuff mm. ever since his administration began. We started with this attack on the Capitol and everything that issued from that. So this may be the beginning of setting the tone for Washington as usual under President Biden. Absolutely. And and Joshua, Joshua Johnson, by the way, sorry, I said we said Jackson a second ago. Biden really pushed the idea of being the person who could bring the country together. Now, we were just discussing this with Shannon. So as well as this GOP response, we're expecting one from within his own party. So what kind of challenge does this present that, that this is kind of the state of affairs for him right now? It feels risky on two fronts. One is that the president knows that there is a significant faction within the Democratic Party that wants the party to pull further to the left. There are plenty of Democrats who are very vocal 
about saying that the party's overall agenda is not ambitious enough on things like racial justice or especially climate change. So that's something I think the president actually does need to listen to. However, I think there's also a risk for Democrats because they have to remember most Americans are neither Democrats nor Republicans. The plurality, according to Gallup's latest poll, are independents. As of their latest poll, we're 25 percent Republican, 32 percent Democrat and 41 percent independent. So if the party ignores that the plurality, at times the majority of the electorate, Mm. is not on the left or the right, but it's solidly in the middle and chooses who it likes, they might lose the opportunity to move anything forward by forcing people in the middle to pull to the left. It feels risky on both fronts. Mm, That's a really good point. And Joshua is delivering this speech in a room that not long ago was the scene of an insurrection against his presidency. We saw this this terrible thing play out in this very room. How does that play into tonight? I think it gives him a chance, an obligation, really, to set Mm. a tone for the country. And that's what Joe Biden is best at, is projecting empathy is just looking into the camera and looking at you rather than looking at Congress. He's got an opportunity to sort of be the grown up in the room, to calm things down, to set a tone, to say, here is how we're going to move forward. I think the country kind of needs that right now. He also knows that he's dealing with a Washington that has become increasingly politically poisonous. It was his Democratic predecessor, Barack Obama, who during his first joint address to Congress in 2009 was laying out his health care agenda. And when he said that his health care plan was not going to cover undocumented immigrants, that was the moment that South Carolina Republican Congressman Joe Wilson yelled, you lie from Mm. the back of the room. Remember that? (laughs) Nancy Pelosi shot daggers at him. Everybody started going. And Joe Biden was sitting behind Barack Obama, looked down, shook his head. So he knows what he's walking into. And Mm. he's got to set a tone, not just for the country, but for the chamber as well. And and Joshua, also one other thing, just when we get back to talking about his agenda and and what he wants to do going forward, we know that he's laid out these three plans, these two different types of these infrastructure plans, as well as the COVID relief package, all three with huge price tags. Now, we know that there's a lot of back and forth going on within Congress about how that's going to be paid for, what Republicans will agree to. But what does his message need to be to the American people on that front? I think his message needs to be a few things. One is, I think, clarifying what he means by infrastructure. Mm. I think there's a legitimate argument as to what we need to do right now and what we can do later. Everyone agrees that infrastructure is roads, tunnels, bridges, airports, seaports. That obviously makes sense. There's a case to be made for things like universal preschool or tuition-free community colleges, especially with the changing economy. But do you call it infrastructure? Terminology matters. And I think he's got to explain what we mean and why we need to do all of these things now, whether as opposed to whether we can do them in pieces. And especially after this expensive COVID relief package, as much as the American people like it, at a certain point, you got to be able to explain how you pay for it. So this Mm. is the place, Savannah, again, where Mm -hmm. I feel like we have a chance to really begin to start like Okay, the crisis is over. We're dealing with the insurrection on January 6th. Now let's begin my administration. This Mm. could be the moment where he actually starts being a normal every day, Monday to Friday (laughs) president like we're used to. (laughs) Normal. Joshua Johnson, an early early member of our NBC News Now family. It's good to have you back here. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Thanks. Let's get a check on your morning news now weather, which means that Bill Cairns is here. Hello, Bill. Hey, good morning, guys. Remember yesterday's uh, you know fantastic uh, game show style thing we did. Yes. Oh yeah. How could we yes. forget? Yeah, what you I mean when you tried to trick us? Day for. <laughs> I, I didn't try to trick you. And maybe that's the problem. See, I thought I thought for sure that Jeopardy would call you know and ask me to guest host <laughs> after that and. Uh, just just didn't happen. Uh-uh. Uh, all right. So, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't that great, but we'll work on it. Maybe we'll do it again someday. 
All right, so let's get to this forecast here. So we have a severe weather threat, and we have the summer warmth heading to the East Coast. So we have a lot of activity going on, and some of it could actually be a little bit dangerous. The severe weather threat continues this morning in areas of Oklahoma and North Texas, and it does look like we're going to get some large hail, maybe another ice case of some isolated tornadoes. We actually had 10 tornadoes reported yesterday, no significant damage, but we're going to watch some big cities today, Oklahoma City, Dallas included, and San Antonio in that threat. And we even could get a few strong thunderstorms for our friends in Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and Buffalo. It's that warm in those areas. We already have flash flood warnings around Wichita Falls. We have 4 million people under flood watches. We're going to see a lot of rain over the next two to three days in this area from Dallas through Little Rock, the Ozarks, St. Louis, and even including the Ohio Valley. So for today, there's the storms in the middle of the country heading into the Midwest. Look at the East Coast. One of the warmest spots in the entire country today will be the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., 87. Seven degrees. New York jumps to 84, but it doesn't last. Rain will return on Thursday for New York City. Uh, Temperatures dropping down into the 70s. So uh, it's a one day heat wave in the Big Apple. So a little <laughs> taste of summer and then back to spring. As long as we don't have winter again. I'm yeah, good. Yeah. All good. No more snow. We're yeah. good. We I can agree. handle the rain. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Coming up, Americans, or at least some Americans, can't wait to ditch work from home and finally return to their offices. But how can that be done as safely as possible? One company might have the answer. That's next. The FBI has announced it's opening a federal civil rights investigation into the police shooting of Andrew Brown. Meanwhile, a family-backed autopsy says he was killed by a bullet to the back of the head. NBC News correspondent Kerry Sanders joins us now from Elizabeth City, North Carolina, with the latest. Kerry, good morning. Well, good morning, Joe. You know, protests here have been peaceful, but now with a curfew, in fact, last night there were some confrontations, a weary public demanding to see the body camera footage so they can determine for themselves what happened when deputies moved in, shot and killed Andrew Brown seven days ago. Overnight in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, a newly imposed city curfew leading to arrests. It comes as a newly released surveillance video shows sheriff's deputies moving in on Andrew Brown last week to serve an arrest warrant for allegedly selling illegal drugs. Seconds after the marked pickup truck passes by, deputies can be heard yelling for Brown to get his hands up, but it does not show the actual shooting. An attorney for Brown's family says a 20-second video clip they were allowed to watch shows Brown was in his car at the time with his hands on the steering wheel. A private autopsy requested by the family found he was shot four times in his right arm, the fifth and final bullet that killed him in the back of his head, which the county medical examiner confirms. It's obvious he was trying to get away. It's obvious. And they're going to shoot him in the back of the head. Uh, execution. That's what took place. The Pasquotank County Sheriff saying, in part, a private autopsy is just one piece of the puzzle. A judge will decide if footage will be made public, which the sheriff says he wants. The FBI now getting involved, announcing a federal civil rights investigation as a devastated family and community demand answers. A judge here at the courthouse is expected to hear arguments later this morning about the body camera and dash cam video. He could decide to release it to the Brown family and lawyers or release it to the public at large or not release it at all. Joe. All right, Carrie Sanders, thank you so much. We continue to hear from voters this week as we mark President Biden's first 100 days in office. Today, we're in Kent County, Michigan, a traditionally Republican county. He managed to flip blue in November by a 7 percent margin. It's only the second time in half a century that happened. So what do they think there now? NBC's Dasha Burns is, of course, the one who is in Kent County, Michigan. She spoke to voters on both sides of the aisle. She asked for how long now, Dasha? It feels like years. <laughs> Good morning. Good to see you. Thanks for being with us. And welcome back to your second home. <laughs> Savannah, I'm getting closer and closer to that <laughs> condo on Lake Michigan every <laughs> single day. Um, that sounds pretty yeah, nice. Listen, as you know, we've been spending 
<laughs> We've been spending a lot of time in Kent County for almost well over a year, almost two years at this point. And all the voters that we caught up with this week, we have uh, been in very close contact with. I've been calling them for way too long. I can't believe they still pick up my phone calls. But um, we have been following some of the, the, the demographics of voters that we thought might help Joe Biden do what seemed very difficult at one point to flip this county blue for just a second time in half a century. And a lot of those voters were actually Republicans. This is a traditionally red county, but there are a lot of moderate Republicans in this area who were having a bit of a political identity crisis. And most of those folks that we've been following did, in fact, vote for Biden. And we've also been talking to some of the people that represent the changes uh, in this uh, suburban county. It's been growing. It's been becoming more diverse. And a lot of voters of color really galvanized and helped the Democratic Party push this over the edge in November. So we talked to uh, an array of voters from all of those uh, Im important constituencies. And uh, we asked them for a bit of a report card on how Biden's doing 100 days in. And his grade was averaging between an A and a B, mostly A minuses, B pluses for that overall score. And I want you to hear from Belinda Bowman. She grew up with the Republican Party. She's actually a leader in the evangelical community here and she voted for Biden. And here's how she thinks he's doing so far. Listen. I would say he's at about an A minus. And for the very reason that I voted for him on. And that was um, to restore a sense of dignity back to the office of the president as well as a sense of calm and normalcy to what it means to govern. We've had normal, we've had boring Biden, and it has been awesome for me. The highest marks by far, Savannah, were when it comes to his handling of the pandemic. Everyone is thrilled to see his promise kept on getting shots in arms and doing that quickly, Savannah. All right, Dasha, let's now talk about the flip side and what they want him to improve on in this NBC News polling we got this week. We know that his lowest marks were on gun control and immigration. Is that the same there in Michigan? Yeah, what we heard really did reflect a lot of what we saw in that NBC News poll. People across the political spectrum on immigration, whether they were more conservative or more liberal on the issue, were very frustrated with how this administration uh, is handling it. Um, also, the folks we talked to wanted to see more bipartisanship, wanted to see more effort to reach uh, across the aisle, especially people uh, on uh, the traditionally Republican side. But it was interesting, Savannah, to hear a lot of policies brought up, a lot of different issues that people really cared about. Of course, one of the top concerns, policing. We've had a lot of conversation uh, around that lately. And I want you to hear from Daryl Ross on that. He's a local restaurant owner and he's incredibly active in the community. Take a listen. I think um, inevitably we, we need to have a conversation on policing, which um, you cannot have without having open dialogue about race. So I'm, I'm hoping that President Biden, you know, ushers that in or begins to have that frank conversation, because really, un until we tackle that, um, a lot of the social issues and, and police violence and, and those ills that are, are really hit our homes every day aren't going to change. Savannah, it was exciting to hear voters mm -hmm. excited to talk about real policy, to really dig in and, and hold uh, this administration accountable. I heard uh, issues of, of gun control, a young mom concerned for her three-year-old girl as she goes back to school, um, climate change, uh, energy costs, the economy. It was it, People were really digging into the things that they care about and they want to see this White House prioritize. Absolutely. And Dasha, what about those Republicans that you spoke with? Do they still identify with the GOP? Is that still their political party? Yeah, that's a great question and a complicated answer. As you can imagine, these folks are really wrestling with that political identity crisis. The party that mm -hmm. they grew up with is one that they say they don't really recognize anymore. They're not necessarily, though, ready to jump into the blue wave uh, of the Democratic side either. For this, I want you to hear from Cynthia Timmerman. She calls herself a Jerry Ford Republican. She's also called herself a repulsed Republican. Take a listen to how she feels now. I'm still repulsed, but I, um, I'm considering myself an independent now. 
I've not quite jumped over into the Democratic um, side, but um, but I'm definitely not a member of the GOP anymore. I actually called them and asked them to remove me from their roles. I asked these voters whether they would consider or look into the midterms, for example, voting for a Republican candidate for office. Those answers ranged from no to maybe if there was a mm. candidate that they felt uh, represented them. But it looks like it's going to take a lot of work for the GOP to win back some of these Jerry Ford Republicans in the hometown of Gerald Ford here in Grand Rapids <laughs> in the Kent County area, Savannah. Yeah, when I was on the road leading up to the election, I heard a lot of the term politically homeless. And it sounds like that's what some of them are feeling there. Dasha, thank you so much. As companies begin to welcome employees back to the workplace, many experts believe that weekly testing is the key to a safe return. NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wynn joins us now with more on that and the new push for at-home testing. Vicki, good morning. Hi, good morning, Joe and Savannah. It doesn't look like much, but this is a rapid antigen test for COVID-19. Check it out. I took this yesterday at my kitchen table. You just do the swab and then you insert it in here. It reacts with a reagent. And look, I got my negative COVID-19 result in just minutes. This is now available over the counter. And a lot of experts say this could be the key for getting us all back to work safely. Take a rapid COVID-19 test twice a week at work. That's now an option for hundreds of employees at GenPact, a digital consulting company in Texas. I am going in to get my test. Michelle Boylan says it was a no-brainer to opt in. A quick swab of the nose, and within minutes, she learns the result on her phone. If it's positive, she heads home to isolate before coming into contact with coworkers. If she's negative, she goes into the office. Does it give you peace of mind? Total peace of mind. We want to return to work, but we want to do it safely. And this helps us. What is this doing for your employee population? Uh, it's improving their morale. It's improving their confidence that when we say, look, we really have safety protocols that allow you to come to office. Now, some scientists say programs like GenPax should become standard practice so employees can safely return to work without fear that their coworkers could be asymptomatic but infectious. Harvard epidemiologist Dr. Michael Minna has been advocating for frequent rapid testing since the start of the pandemic. What do you think is the biggest misconception when it comes to rapid testing? That rapid tests are not accurate. When used frequently, say twice a week, they will be very sensitive. He says these rapid antigen tests will catch people who are sick before they even know they're sick, which means they stay home and don't spread the disease. Is that the most effective way to get back to what we had pre-pandemic, to reopen businesses, to reopen schools safely? Absolutely. Even if spread is ongoing in the community. He says while GenPAC's program is a good first step, businesses and even schools should adopt at-home testing. We saw it firsthand back in January. So now you're going to swab your nose. Uh -huh. For this test made by Abbott, simply swab your nose, insert it into the card, and results appear in about 15 minutes. This is definitely giving me pregnancy test flashbacks. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> to see how effective these tests can be in the real world, Minna launched a study with Citibank in February, asking 6,000 employees to test themselves at home three times a week. The results are uploaded to an app, which tells them whether or not they can go into the office. What have you found so far? Almost immediately, we began finding uh, infected individuals who would have otherwise gone to work not knowing that they were positive and transmissible that day. The Citibank study will be completed in June. Meanwhile, GenPact is also finding asymptomatic cases. The CDC says using workplace screening to stop the spread of virus is most effective when combined with masking and social distancing. The agency recommends weekly testing, especially for businesses like hair salons and manufacturing plants, where employees are close together. Testing plus vaccination together, I think, is the way to bring the economy back in a much faster way. Now, GenPAC's testing program is voluntary, but the company says about 70 percent of its workers are taking part. And very soon they will be doing these tests right at home. So if they get a positive, they stay at home, they get a confirmation PCR test. But that really helps to reduce the risk of spread because now they don't even have to go into the office. Savannah and Joe. So, Vicky, can anyone buy these at home tests and how much do they cost? 
Yeah, Joe, the FDA just issued emergency use authorization for two of these at-home tests, this one made by Abbott, and there's another one made by a company called Illum. That one will be available by the end of May. You can walk into a CVS or a Walgreens. They range from $24 to $38 for a pack of two. So it's not quite that affordable yet, but the idea is to bring the cost down. And hey, Vicki, it's Savannah. Quick question. How accurate are these tests? Savannah, the experts we talked to say they're very accurate when used as a screening tool. The idea here is to make them cheap and to do this often so that you can catch people when they are infectious. Uh, so that's really the key. And that's the role that these tests could have played a long time ago, mm. frankly, according to Dr. Mina and others. That would have helped us bring the infection rate way down because COVID-19, when you're asymptomatic and infectious, you can be out there not knowing that you're spreading the disease. If you're taking these frequent tests often, then you catch that disease so much sooner and you mm. stay home. Hopefully folks realize that testing is still important yes. as we move forward. All right, Vicki, thank you so yeah. much. Great Even report. with the vaccinations. Yes, yes, definitely. Thanks, Vicki. Coming up, Homeland Security is now cracking down on human smuggling groups at the southern border. We'll take a closer look at their newest operation next. The American Medical Association is showing its support for the transgender community, writing to governors urging them to veto transgender medical bans. In a letter to the National Governors Association, the AMA says that stopping kids under age 18 from receiving transition-related care is a dangerous government intrusion. The association's CEO also cited evidence that trans and non-binary gender identities are normal variations of human identity and expression, adding that decisions about care belong in the hands of health care providers and families, not lawmakers. The state of Arkansas has banned transition-related care for minors, and at least 14 other states are considering similar legislation, according to the American Civil Liberties Union. Savannah doctors also say that this type of transition care, it helps reduce anxiety, mm. depression, suicide attempts. It's incredibly important and really vital. Oh, absolutely. You can totally just imagine the effect on mental health. Yeah. You just said thanks, Joe. The Department of Homeland Security is launching a new operation targeting groups that smuggle immigrants across the southern border. It's called Operation Sentinel, and it's designed to cut off the way smugglers make their money. NBC News Justice correspondent Julia Ainsley joins us now with more on her reporting. So, Julia, let's pick up right there with what I just said. This effort isn't just about catching these human smugglers in the act. It's about disrupting that profit. So how is that going to work back on that front end? That's right. So they say that they are going after people and property and profit, all of the above. They want to disrupt everything that was really part of a smuggling network. That means not just going after the person who might be carrying immigrants across the border, dropping children from a tall wall, as we've seen, but actually the people who are really orchestrating the whole network. They call these transnational criminal organizations. These aren't small operations. They're really part of a larger scheme, and they want to disrupt them so that they are no longer uh, able to profit at least as much on such a lucrative business, which is to smuggle human beings across the border illegally. And Julia, I want to ask you about something called Title 42. So this was put in place last year to try to stop the spread of COVID over the border, but many immigration experts are actually critical of it. So how has Title 42 affected human smuggling in the pandemic and what is that criticism? Well, Savannah, I'm glad you asked about that because I think Title 42 has to be part of this conversation about smugglers. A lot of advocates and immigration experts say that they've actually seen an uptick not only in smuggling, but in the price that smugglers can charge while Title 42 has been in place. It started under the Trump administration. The Biden administration has continued it, expelling all immigrants except for unaccompanied children when they come to the southern border. So what that's doing is it's incentivizing smugglers who can try to sneak immigrants into the country undetected. Mm -hmm. And when they are expelled, there are actually very few consequences so they could keep trying again and again. Advocates say this is really dangerous because it's instead putting these, these people's lives in the hands of smugglers rather than allowing them to come legally to our ports of entry and claim asylum, as they say they have the right to do. Um, so that's really part of this conversation. When Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas was asked about that yesterday, he said, look, Title 42 has to remain in place in order to stop the pandemic. I should 
should say that's something that public health experts have questioned, whether or not that really has an effect on U.S. rates. But he also said that at the same time, they need to address smuggling and that they are tackling both elements. And part of the reason that the smuggling has to be addressed is exactly what you just mentioned a moment ago, seeing this video of toddlers dropped from the top of this border fence. I mean, it's just heartbreaking. Now, what do we know about what happens to those who have been smuggled over the border? Well, right, Savannah. I mean, I think that those images, uh, the eight-year-old that we saw in the desert approaching Mm. CBP saying he had been abandoned while he was asleep by smugglers were bringing him. Those are all really bringing this topic to the forefront of our attention right now, especially during this current influx of migrants. What happens to those people? Well, often, uh, you know, if they're lucky, they're found by Border Patrol. Uh, The children are allowed to stay to be processed. Adults and many families are still expelled from the country. But it, it isn't that Operation Sentinel will necessarily be going after those people. They're really seen as the victims here of human smuggling. Julia Ainsley, thank you so much. Let's now take a look at what's making news around the world this morning. NBC News foreign correspondent Sarah Harmon joins us from London. Sarah, good morning. Hey, Joe. Hey, Savannah. Good morning to both of you. Let's start in the Persian Gulf, an interesting encounter there between an American warship that fired warning shots in a tense encounter with Iran. The Navy said the USS Firebolt fired the warning shots after three fast attack Revolutionary Guard vessels came within 68 yards. The U.S. released some black and white footage of the encounter. Iran did not immediately acknowledge the incident. The European Union is about to sign a deal for 1.8 billion doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. The EU's vaccine drive has been plagued by problems, including a dispute with AstraZeneca. Its vaccination rates are way behind the U.S. and Britain. Finally, guys, Her Majesty the Queen is back at work after the death of her husband, Prince Philip, earlier this month. The monarch appeared via video link from Windsor Castle while welcoming some dignitaries to Buckingham Palace. You got to say, at 95, that is some work ethic. (laughs) Joe, Savannah? It's so true. Pretty impressive. Sarah, thank you so much. Coming up, genetically modified mosquitoes. What might sound like a nightmare is actually being put to good use in Florida. We'll show you what exactly they're being used for up next. It's time for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. CNBC senior markets correspondent Dominic Chu joins us now. Good morning, Dom. Good morning, Savannah. Good morning, Joe. We'll start off in Saudi Arabia, where Crown Prince, uh, he says the kingdom is in talks to sell a small stake in the state-run oil giant Aramco to some global energy company. Now, in a rare TV interview, Mohammed bin Salman, or MBS as he's known in many circles, says Aramco, the world's biggest oil company, could sell more shares, including to international investors in the next year or two. MBS is increasingly leaning on Aramco to help pay for his ambitious plans to transform the Saudi Arabian economy. Facebook and Instagram are working on tools to help creators make more money. These include online shops so creators can sell items directly on the platforms and get a cut of the sales that they promote. Social media companies are trying to spur the creation of more content to keep users engaged on those sites. Twitter has also been testing new tools, including a super follow function, giving people access to exclusive content to people they follow for a fee. And Sony says it sold nearly 8 million PlayStation 5 consoles as as of the end of March with more than 3 million moved in just the first three months of the year. Earlier this month, research firm NPD said that the PS5 was the fastest selling console in U.S. history since launching in November, both in terms of units sold and the total dollar amount spent by customers. That PS5 is still very difficult, guys, to come by with demand far outstripping supply. And Savannah Joe not helping matters, the fact that there is still a global computer chip shortage, including those to make video game consoles. Back over to you. Well, if anyone wants one, I still have my PS2. Oh, God. So. I still have an Xbox, like, version Xbox one. one. I'm an Xbox One. Yeah. I have an Xbox One. Me yes. too, Doc. <laughs> used to be really into that snowboarding game, but it's been a minute. <laughs> we could do without it. <laughs> Thanks so much. You got it, guys. 
Now to a particularly itchy subject that's all the buzz. A mosquito experiment in the Florida Keys is attempting to control the population of the annoying but potentially deadly insect. One company is working on a way to genetically modify the bug to stop it from multiplying. NBC Sam Brock joins us now from Miami. And Sam, I think this is good news for me because I'm one of those people where like each limb turns into one massive mosquito bite in the summer. <laughs> We're in the same boat. The mosquitoes <laughs> just seem to find me wherever yes, I go. And I get the impression, too. Savannah, that it's the same thing for you. There's a lot of reasons why people come down to Florida. The mosquitoes is not one of them. But there's a company now that's developed an entirely new technology they believe will limit their spread by actually, Savannah, releasing more mosquitoes into the environment. But just the males, that it turns out, don't bite in the hopes that their female counterparts will stop spreading disease. Inside boxes like these on the Florida Keys, a possible key to what scientists hope will slow an invasive and dangerous mosquito species. They're called Aedes aegypti and are known to carry diseases like Zika, Dengue, and Yellow Fever, the females spreading infection with their bites. In the Keys, they make up just about 4% of the mosquito population, but are responsible for virtually all of the mosquito-borne disease transmission uh, to humans. The potential solution starts at Oxitec's lab, where tiny eggs are injected with a modified DNA strain, ultimately producing mosquitoes that have what's called a self-limiting gene. Only the male offspring can survive past an early stage. The boys, unlike their female counterparts, do not bite. They run out of females to, to meet with, and that's how you bring the population down. This week, Oxitec began the process of releasing 140,000 male eggs in six locations along the Keys. That is part of a live experiment greenlit by the EPA, though some environmentalists are crying foul. Genetic engineered organisms are not something that we can control. Evolution will find its own way. This isn't disrupting anything within the environment naturally? We haven't seen that, no, and we are targeting the 80s aegypti that is invasive. The company says similar projects in Brazil led to a 94% reduction of the targeted mosquito population and point out their research is peer-reviewed. Locally, residents buzzing about benefits and risks of unexpected consequences. My gut feeling says it's probably not a good thing. You know, it, we don't know enough about it. The EPA says they conducted an extensive risk assessment based on the best available science and does not expect the trial to have adverse effects to animals in the environment. Does this represent the potential for greatly reducing the amount of Zika or dengue fever that's prevalent in a community? We hope so. That's why we're doing this. It is roughly 12,000 mosquitoes that are released over the course, Savannah and Joe, of 12 weeks, which is how you get that 140,000 number. And they're in boxes on people's properties that have agreed to do this. That's oh, where gosh. they are located. There are eggs there. They say they add some food and some water, and they hatch within a week and a half. Guys? <laughs> It's like having a pet, but not really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, Sam, my theory, of course, you're very tall. You're taller than me. Don't the, the mosquitoes, didn't, didn't you always learn it as a kid? They go to the tallest person. That's why you held your hand I, up. I did hear that. that. So, yeah. Sam, for those who know, it's about that nine feet tall. That explains a lot. So. I think so. <laughs> That doesn't explain why I get bit so much, though. Maybe uh, the high heels? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not always high heels. <laughs> oh, you're playing soccer? I <laughs> Sam, interesting report. Thank you so much. Tomorrow marks President Biden's 100th day in office. Presidential historian Michael Beschloss takes a look back at the first chapter of the Biden administration and weighs in on whether it's a good metric for judging a presidency. Joe Biden has had 100 days where he's done most of the things that he's promised. Uh, he has thrown the resources of the presidency and the federal government uh, behind efforts to uh, quell the pandemic. The economy is improving. The threats to democracy have diminished. And he's got a, an approval rating, which by historical standards may not seem wonderful, but by the standards of these last 15 very divisive years is actually very sound. I think they will look back on the moments in this period where Joe Biden said, we've gotten this many shots into arms and we're now up to this and it's now this available. 
That's the fundamental reason why Joe Biden was elected, was to help Americans to protect themselves. They're doing it. Joe Biden is certainly in the tradition of other presidents in history who came to office at a time of great crisis. 1861, greater crisis, Abraham Lincoln came in just as the country was splitting apart and rushing towards civil war. 1933, Franklin Roosevelt came in, the banks were closed, huge numbers of people were out of work and suffering. People will look at Biden and say he came in at the time of a pandemic, at the time of an economic calamity, at a time in which democracy was in danger. I think one thing that historians will say about Joe Biden is that we are benefiting from the fact that he was vice president at the time that President Obama came in, in 2009, at a time of extreme economic calamity. Biden saw what it was like to hit the ground running and try to immediately as possible fix people's problems. In terms of Donald Trump, Joe Biden was elected as the antithesis of Donald Trump. Any president knows that anything can happen at any time and the vice president also has to be prepared. Because he has been vice president for eight years, you can be sure that he will benefit from that experience in bringing Kamala Harris in as much as possible and making this a team effort. The 100 days is an important mark to see how a president has come out of the gate, what kind of leadership he or one day she has exercised. But if you look at the history of the American presidents, most of the important things they do do not happen during these first three months. So stay tuned. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.